I'm Elisa. I'm one of the owners of the North End Organic Nursery here. I also own Flutterby Gardens Landscaping. So there are multiple different types of propagation that you can go through. Uh, the first and foremost is something that everybody always knows about is seeds. Um, seed packs normally will tell you the amount of days that you need to plant them from up until the point that you get the harvest. So how I start stuff is I seed in my trays. And in a little bit here on the next few pages, I'm going to go through the seeding procedure with you that I do here at Neon. I get them to a certain height. Let's say we get them this high. From this state, I take them and I pot them up into one of these. We use coconut coir instead of peat moss because it's a sustainable product. Um, it also doesn't have the acidity that peat does. These actually will dispose in your ground. If you still have them from last year, go ahead and just till them in because it's a soil amendment at the same time. But so we'll take them and we'll pot them up from this put them into here, and then I have another month or two of growing to get that to root out enough to be a sellable plant for you guys. Mm -hmm. So what you would do from this stage is probably go out and take this and put it in your yard. So I have an extra step on top of what I do to get it to be a sellable product for you. As long as we start late enough, it's, it's okay to put it out. Right, and right. there is one other page in there. So it's a black and white page that tells you each different crop type and how many days that you need for that to grow. So you have your own little chart there where you could go and plan out your garden and be like, hey, by this date, if I want to be producing tomatoes, you know, in September, I have to have my starts done by this point. That's this page. Yes. The spring frost free date in my garden is, what do you say? I say Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's not even true. Last year it was true, the year before that, it snowed the week after Mother's Day. I remember, because I was outside and all my vegetables were on the racks and the temperature was going down and down and down. It's like the middle of the day and I can see my plants like before my eyes. And me and all the girls are like, oh my God, hurry, put them in the greenhouse. So yeah, you just never know in Boise. Normally it's like the snow off Schaefer Butte or Mother's Day. That's a good general rule of thumb. But we also have ways that you can extend your season. Um, right there. Right. Well, I think that might still be a little soon. But we also have options like these. These are caps that are made out of recycled milk jugs. They're also made in Idaho. And you can, they're plant protectors. We have small and large. These ones are really neat because you can take them apart there on the side and hook a bunch of them together and make a long tunnel out of them. We also have row cover and the little hoops and the cold frames. And so there's multiple different ways to extend your season. Okay, so you also have division. Division is done with things like iris, lilies, stuff like that. You could do cuttings. Cuttings, when I'm thinking of cutting, I'm normally thinking of a house plant. That's my general rule of thumb is when I'm doing a cutting, I'm trying to get a new house plant because I have like a tropical forest in my home. What about shrubs? I would say you could do cuttings off of those. You could do woody cuttings. Yeah. And that would be a good way to, like, you could do that with roses. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you could use. So if you do the cutting, then you, you dip it in, like, a root hormone? Yep, we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm just touching on everything I'm going to touch on okay. through this talk in this little slide right here. Okay. All right. So we have two different types of grafting. We also have tissue culture, which is more of, like, a chemist yeah. kind of sort of deal. There's multiple different knives or tools that you can use when you're doing propagation. You have budding, grafting, and garden knives. Um, this kind of just depends on what you like. I just use like a little pocket knife. I also use my pruners. I normally have my pruners on me. But um, here's a pair of an example. When you're talking about pruners, you always want to bypass. You don't ever want the anvil because the bypass makes it so you're not crimping the stem because if you're using those anvils they just come down on each other and a lot of times that'll crimp the stem and that'll prevent the flow of nutrients or moisture up and down the stem so the bypass is that curved blade yeah and the bypass is it just passes like yeah. it basically bypass instead of the two blades hitting together they pass by each other and that forms a cleaner cut for you so there's those um Scalpel, a dibble. A dibble is normally what you use to put seeds in. I use my finger. I use a pencil top, a pen. And, right. And, and, and honestly, again, I'll go through this with you when I go through my neon seeding procedures. It all depends on the seed that you're using, too, because the seed size is going to be key. And if you need a dibble, if you're just laying the seed right on top, how you're going to proceed from that point. 
you always want a sharpener because you never want to use tools that are dull because normally if your tools are dull, they're probably not clean either and you're going to spread disease. And if you have an unsharpened tool, you're instead of cutting, doing a nice clean cut, you're tearing the tissue of the plant. Um, so there's supplies too. Of course, you're going to want a pen. You're going to want labels, twine, tape disinfectant because anytime you move from one plant to the next you disinfect your tools. Um, another good rule of thumb is never pruning or cutting on any sort of plant while there's moisture in the air whether it's raining, frozen, anything like that. These are things that you don't want to be pruning on a plant. If there's moisture you're spreading disease more rapidly from plant to plant because of the moisture it goes from one plant to the next. Now, if it's frozen, you're tearing the tissue of the plant because it's brittle and it's frozen. And so imagine breaking something. It's not going to give you a clean break. It's going to fracture on you. Tell me, tell me realistically, how do you dip between each one? How do I what? How do you disinfect? How do, you disinfect? How do I disinfect? I carry a little bottle of bleach water, like a tiny little amount of bleach, like a little spray bottle. We have these little tiny tip and sprays that you could use from that, a Clorox wipe in your pocket, wipe your blade between cutting, you know, it's, it's actually pretty simple. Carry a bucket around of water you just dip your tool in. So, I mean, there's ways that you can do it. It's just being mindful of that fact. <coughs> have pots. Of course, again, here we only use the coconut coir pots. You have your different types of flats. Um, you can see here we have just a regular closed bottom flat. We have our plug trays. We have our lids. So these are all things that you're going to want to do if you're growing on a larger scale than just one or two plants. Um, grafting wax is something that I really don't think you guys will really need to worry about too much. Rooting hormone, now again, this is going to come when we're going to house plants and such. Also can be done on shrubs, roses, you know, different perennials out in your yard, depending. Normally perennials are divided. But, so this could be used on a lot of different items as well. It comes as a liquid or a powder. Um, a soil thermometer because of course you want to make sure those soil temperatures are optimal for your plants to grow because if you don't have those optimal soil temps you're not going to have anything happening. A hand seeder. I'm kind of back and forth on the hand seeders because we seed in obviously huge quantities around here and I've done it with it and I've done it without it and sometimes I feel like the hand seeder is just that one more step that makes it a little bit more difficult and you're kind of messing with it and it's not always working right and it's um, just a little thing like this it's almost like a needle but you can open it up and put the seeds inside and when you push the top down it pops the seed out so or sometimes like cherry like. kind of yeah I mean literally it's like Cereal this like big this. yeah it's like a little clear plastic thing where you put the seeds inside and it has a little divot that goes down and pops a seed out for you. Right. But you know depending on the product or the type of plant you're growing I do suggest seeding with more than one seed because if you're seeding with just one seed and every single little cell 90% of those cells probably aren't going to develop for you but if you do with two seeds well you have a better germination rate and if you have two healthy plants well Later on, you thin out the less healthy one and you keep the good one. Um, we also have seeding nozzles, which is a light mist, so you're not blowing around the seeds in your tray because, like, when you seed it, this is what it's going to look like. It's just going to be a tray of dirt. And so imagine if you get your regular hose and you come and spray this, well, all the dirt's going to go all over and your seeds are going to go all over too. So using that mister nozzle is always a really good thing to keep all of your supplies where you put them. Equipment. So equipment is really, really important. I think especially when you're doing the very, very first seeding adventure that you're going through. You want to make sure you have the right trays. You want to make sure you have the right soil. You want to have a flat for the bottom so the water is not spilling everywhere. Inside I use the closed bottom trays. Outside I use the open bottom trays because in here I don't want all the water building up. Out there I don't care if it pours down on everything. So there's a different way of attacking everything. You're going to want a thermostat because temperatures, soil temperatures and air temperatures are both really, really important when you're starting seedlings. Um, lights. 
Light is a huge factor. It's mainly a factor after the seeds come up. You will never be able to mimic the sun's light, ever. Um, I had my teacher from Boise State come in here, and you can see how close we have these lights. And I had him even closer to the plant than that, and he basically put his lumen meter right up next to the light, and it barely even registered on it. And then I took it out into the greenhouse on a shady day, and it was going like off the charts. So a south-facing window, something where you're getting a lot of bright, intense light is a good thing. Now, if you are using a lighting system, keeping it a couple of inches away from the plants is always the best way to do it, because that's gonna produce a short, stout, strong little plant. Now, if those plants are reaching for the sky, they're gonna be like me and tall and spindly and not super healthy. So if I understand <laughs> Yes. I wouldn't let them touch, but like an inch or two above them, yes, would be the best way to do it. Um, you could use cold frames. It's a way to extend your season through the winter. Uh, you could grow lettuces, any of your cold crops, spinach, radish, broccoli, you know, all of these things could be grown through the winter with a cold frame, a mini greenhouse, or a greenhouse. I was going to bring one up. I do have some outside. It's basically this right here. It's a type of frame that you put over the ground and you put your vegetables inside of it so it attaches right on top of the ground. But you can lift this lid up when it gets too hot, but you can also access your plants through that lid right there. Do I need to flip that the other way for you? Yeah, I'm thinking you do. Okay. I don't know how or I do it myself. I'll do it. They're glass or plastic. You could use straw bales and put old windows on top of it. There's so many different ways that you can make a cold frame and make them really inexpensive, too. So. <laughs> yeah, and this is basically what this is, is these are old windows. And they basically did like a system of boards. <laughs> Sorry, somebody was in a brat back there. Okay, you could use the system of boards and just make yourself a little rectangle or a square or whatever and use any old windows. You could go to, what are those reclaimed stores? Um, there's the Rehab, Rehabitat. There's one up on Fairview and Five Mile, right? And there's one downtown. Right, so I mean, go somewhere like that. And, or even, you know, they have old doors or um, old, uh, what are those? The doors <laughs> outside your door. <laughs> screen doors. You could get the screen doors and take the stuff out of them and just do like a greenhouse plastic over the top of them. But it has that base frame for your top where you could lift it up and still access your plants. So that would. It's just a box. Basically right. With a square lid. Right. And you can start things in it, can't you? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because, and never, another good thought about a cold frame is putting it up against your house or in a south facing part of your yard, you know, up against your foundation. It's going to stay warmer that way. Um, it's going to get all the south sun. So during the winter, it's going to keep heated up more than anything else. Plus putting it against your frame gives it that little bit more protection and keeps yeah. your soil temps warmer. I have boxes along the west side of my foundation and I was picking greens in mm -hmm. November, right. November. Right. It is very possible to still be growing at this point. Okay, so your soil media. Now, everybody has a different choice or pick about what they want to grow in and how you want to do it. Here, we basically, we do like a soilless mixture. Um, I'm just going to come right out and say it. This is what I use for all of my vegetable plants. It's this Eden Valley. It's an organic potting soil. It has a combination of pretty much, it's got coconut, quad, forest products, peat, moss, bright hole, Rice holes, hummus, composted chicken manure, horticultural sand, dried poultry litter, feather meal, bone meal, bat guano, zebra guano, alfalfa meal, kelp meal, worm castings, dried sardine meal, crab meal, and capoxi meal. Wow. So this has this is what you call your soilless mix. Has absolutely no soil in it. But did you hear all those like beneficial fertilizers? Yeah. The bat guano, the kelp meal, the zebra guano. So these are all things that are going to keep. Well, they're organic, so they're going to keep breaking down throughout the entire life of your plant and giving that plant fertilizers. 
Now, if you're using something like this that has a high compost value, or has these sardine or fat guano meals or something like that, your fertilizer values are higher in it. Plus, anything that's organic takes longer to break down. So it's going to be constantly feeding your plant throughout its life, rather than if you're using those synthetic fertilizers, they come in and they have a bunch of salts in them and they feed your plant really fast and then it's gone. And then your plant is like a plant on crack because it's like, where my crack? <laughs> right? Be and you have to continue to feed it and feed it and feed it. And when you don't continue to do that, your plant gets stressed and then you get the bugs and insects and disease problems that most people find in their gardens. So, Garden of Eden. And this is stuff that we sell here as well. We have all of their, um, Kellogg, I think, is a, Lindsay and I have been through so many different products in the last few years trying to figure out what was the best thing for us to grow in. And we have come up with the Gardener in Bloom because it's organic. Um, it meets our certification because we do have our certification through the Department of Agriculture for our crops. Everything we do is certified organic. And so it meets those certifications. It feeds our plants throughout the life of them being in this little pot. And it's just simple. Gardener and Bloom. Gardener and Bloom. And it's, what again? it's a Kellogg product. And that's another soil that's mixed? Yes. And we have multiple different varieties of this coming in. We even have a seed starter mix. That's another soil that's mixed, which is ver vermiculite and other things that we start our seeds in. Then we bump it up into our pots with this. So there's compost. How many different types of compost are there? There's dairy, chicken, worm. Ooh, worm is a good one. You know why I like worm so much? Because you really can't burn anything with it. Like with the dairy compost and um, the chicken, you can burn your plant sometimes if it's too hot and it hasn't broken down properly. So worm castings have become a big thing lately because you can feed your plants pretty heavily with that and not be worried about number one, the smell, or number two, it burning your plants. So I mean, I would even suggest worm compost for your house plants. You know, top dressing some of your house plants with that. Yeah, you gave us that one time. Mm -hmm. We came here one time. I know, I've talked Whatever to you guys you before. Whatever you open, uh -huh. we came down and gave us bags of that. Uh huh. Yes, it was great. Perlite. Perlite is a good product. Um, it's just the white little puffy stuff. It's good to mix your um, soil media with. My personal preference is the vermiculite. Mm -hmm. I've always used vermiculite over perlite. I feel like it has a better moisture retention and when I was in school in the greenhouses at Boise State, I had a tray of the perlite and I had a tray of the vermiculite and everything that I had in vermiculite prospered and it grew roots faster and it was easier for me to deal with than the perlite tray was. The perlite tray, I would get mold on top of it. I kept having different issues with it. Plus, I didn't have the fast results for roots that I did in the vermiculite. Now, here's a, three different recipes I thought I'd throw in there for you. There's a nutrient-rich recipe that includes your compost, a soilless recipe so you don't have any topsoil in that at all, and then just a sterile recipe where you would just do your peat moss and your perlite. So there's a few different ways that you can mix it up when you are starting Plants. Which plants would you use in those various concoctions? I mean, just what's feed or whatever would you prefer for those? For the soilless or the sterile, I would say like a house plant or doing cuttings or something like that would work in there. Now, if you were doing something like a vegetable where you're wanting the soil media to work with you throughout the life of the plant, I'm going to go ahead and say that's when you do your nutrient rich one. It's never harmful to do the nutrient-rich one because all that's going to do is keep feeding your plant and make sure it's healthy and strong. And garden flowers, which is not, not house plants. Um, I guess we were talking about this, and most garden flowers that I think of, when I think of a garden flower, I think of dividing it. I don't think of cuttings or propagation or anything like that. Mainly what I would do with flowers is a division type of a deal where... You just pull the plant out and you divide it and then you put it somewhere else. So, but and what about the annuals, like annual flowers? You want to start those in, in the I just the start them in a regular mixture. Okay. And that, again, I mean, any one of these soil mixtures would work perfectly for anything that you're wanting to start. It just depends on what you're wanting from it. But any one of these would work for annuals, vegetables, whatever you're looking for, because it's always going to go from where you're starting the seeds to where you're planting them at. And where you're planting them at is the final 
decision for you and where all your nutrients should be. Yes? I noticed up there in your, um, in all three of your recipes, you have perlite, and yet you just said that you prefer the vermiculite over the perlite. So why do you have them have it also in there? These are just three recipes that I have in my growing repertoire kind of deal. So what I personally use at this point over the last three years, I've gotten to the point where I just use something that has everything already mixed in it. Because of the amount, the sheer volume of plants that I grow, I've come to, okay, I'm buying a bagged product. If I could buy it in bulk in those big, huge totes, I would do it, but they just don't offer it like that. But this is just the best product that I found to keep my plants moving throughout the year. The other issue that I do have when I'm growing plants is these coconut pots don't hold water like a normal pot does, like a plastic pot does. So they dry out faster and they leach all of their nutrients away a lot faster. So the product that I, or the soil mix that I'm growing my plants in has to be high, high, high in nutrients. It has to be a continual release and you'll see here, coming up on one of my next slides, I actually mix blood meal in with my potting soil to be a continual nitrogen release throughout the life of the plant until you guys get it home and put it in the ground. Okay, this beautiful picture is our greenhouse um, in March. So right now it's empty. This is how we start out and we just start ramping and ramping up and pretty soon I'll be busting out of both greenhouses out there and up here and crying because I don't have enough room to put everything. All right, seed. So let's go on to seed. There's four different things that you can do with seeds to get them ready for you to germinate them. Leaching. Now, leaching can be done with multiple different types of plants. The three examples I gave was the verbena, which is an annual or a perennial flower, mm -hmm. the desert paintbrush, which is the Castilea linearifolia, or the wax flower. Now, for leaching, you're gonna put your seeds in a jar, you're gonna cover them with water, and you're gonna soak them overnight. The next morning, you strain them out, but you continue running them underwater so they don't dry out for the next few days. Cover them with plastic and you just keep doing that same process for the next few days. Basically what you're trying to do is break down the skin of that seed. Now soaking is almost exactly along the same lines. It can be done with thrifts, spurge, daylilies, and sweet peas. Now these ones have a really, really tough outer coat and so you're soaking them in water overnight. It might be for multiple days, but you're trying to perforate that seed coat. Scarification, moonflower, hollyhock, morning glory. Now this is done by birds when they eat the seed and then they poop it out. Basically as it's going through their digestive system, it gets all roughed up and gives little places for the seed embryo to actually emerge. Um, you can also use a sharp knife and just nick the surface of the seed. You know, just take a little bit off of the top or sandpaper to scratch them. Basically, you're just trying to rough up that seed coat. Stratification, almost around the same lines, except for it's freezing it. It needs to go through, like I have developed a uh, flower grass mix with the turf company, it's called Flutter by Lawn. It's a mixture of four different types of fescues and seven, eight different types of native wildflowers. And this is a seed mix that has to go through 30 to 65 days of cold temperatures below a certain degree for these perennial flowers to go ahead and germinate for you. So this would be your stratification. It's a series of cold days that trigger something in the seed to say, oh, okay, now I've hit my requirement and it's time for me to start growing. So they need a certain amount of days in the cold is basically how that one goes. So many things to consider when you're starting things. When you're starting inside, your soil medium is going to be very, very important. It's almost more important than when you're just throwing seeds in the ground outside because the amount of moisture it keeps, like does it stay soggy? Is it going to get moldy? And so your soil is a very, very, I think that's like your key starting point for where you're going to be prosperous or not in growing seeds because over wet soil is gonna make it so the seeds don't grow. Over dry soil is gonna make it so the seeds don't grow. I mean, there's this very, very fine line of when those seeds are actually gonna germinate for you. Spacing. Now this comes to seeding the trays again. Like, <laughs> I had an intern one year who just littered seeds in the tray. It was just like, oh, I feel like they almost just threw them in there. Where, you know, you should be doing maybe 
two seeds per plug. I found five. And so <laughs> making sure you have ample space for your seeds to grow is a huge spot as well. Because if you've got five seeds in this one tiny little plug right here, let me see if I can get this out. I mean, look at how much room there is for root growth there, number one. So they're all going to be competing with each other the week you're going to die. They might all die because nobody's getting exactly what they need. So making sure that you have ample spacing. Again, the seed packets, very informative, and they're going to tell you exactly how much spacing you need between each seed. But again, I always recommend putting a couple in there. I wouldn't say five ever. No, don't do that. Just <laughs> I mean, even if you're like, oh, I got five plants to go. Well, you have to kill four of those. Or they're all wimps. Right. <laughs> or they all just are like little wimpy wimpies. <laughs> all right. Cover. As you can see, when I'm starting seeds, I put these little white domes on, or these clear domes on top. You want to know why? Because it keeps the humidity in, it keeps them moist longer, and it controls their heated environment as well. So keeping the moisture level exactly where you want it to be is huge. Location. As you can tell, spillage is a big thing here. <laughs> Even if you do have bottom trays. Um, making sure they're on a south-facing window where they're going to stay warmer. Um, so there's all these little different things that you have to think about as you're putting your seating location up you're going to want them to get the most outside light that they possibly can. And you're going to want to give them the less or the least supplemental light that you possibly can. So finding a place that they're going to stay warm and get lots of light is always going to be huge. Monitoring, they're going to need to be monitored every single day. I would say probably at the same time every day. Like the first thing we do when we come here is check our plants. Make sure the moisture level is good. Because some trays are going to dry out a lot faster than other ones are even though we do the exact same thing with everything. <laughs> um, the heat. Now heat is really, really big, especially from when you're starting seeds. Um, the soil temperatures are key to your germination success. Now I've done this, I think it was last year that we did a trial where I started stuff on the exact same day, one on heating mats, one on not heating mats. Three to five days I had germination on the heating mats seven to 14 days I had without. So getting the heat on the optimal soil temperatures, remember that little chart I showed you? Mm -hmm. Soil temperatures are huge when it comes to germination. If it's not that right temperature, that plant will never germinate for you. And you can water it and water it and water it, and then by the time it is that soil temperature, it's not gonna germinate for you because it's been drowned. Lighting, you're gonna use cool white bulbs and seedlings starting. Cool white bulbs. Some grower secrets. Well. Yes. One thing that I really deal with here is dampening off because multiple different people are checking my plants. Moisture levels are hugely important. They always have to stay moist, especially when the seeds are germinating. It's that very, very top line where that seed is that can never dry out. It can't be soaking wet, but it can't dry out at the same time. Now, one thing that we have found is chamomile tea. So when I say brew tea, brew tea, get some chamomile tea, brew it, let it sit there, mix it in with your water. Every time you water your seedlings, do it with the chamomile tea. It prevents dampening off. It's an organic solution. Really? Yes. Wow. You discovered that. Yeah. Discovered that. Uh, just somewhere along the way, we figured it out, and it works. Wow. Huh. It works wonders. Warm water. What? It doesn't do anything. It just prevents dampening off in your seedling starts. You know what dampening off is, right? Yeah. It's when you have a beautiful, protective little plant here, and the next day you come in and everything's like wilted over, and it's just dying from the bottom of the stem up. So this is what it prevents. Okay. And you can use it in a spray bottle. You can use it as bottom water. But using it every single time you water is going to be the key to prevent that, because that's one of the biggest seedling killers is that dampening off. Dampening off. Uh-huh. Warm water. You know when you're a warm, pretty little plant in Hawaii and then somebody comes and throws a bucket of cold water on you? Is it going to make you want to grow? <laughs> no. <laughs> so using, I'm not saying using hot water because if you turn your dial all the way over to hot and you're pulling all that hot water out of your water heater, 
you're pulling all the minerals and ickiness at the bottom as well. So using a lukewarm water, or how about this? Water your plants, fill up your water jug, leave it until the next day. So it's room temperature, and you're not shocking your plants every single time you're watering them. Because it's that cold shock that's going to set them back. I mean, it might just be like this much, but you do it every single day, and it's going to start stunting them. Even if you got them like on cold put them outside, then what? I would try and do it with warmer water. I mean, you know, don't want to add to. And at this point in time, I wouldn't think you would really need any moisture in your cold frame, would you? Do you have a cold frame? No. Because we have a greenhouse outside where we have cold crops growing in them. They're a bit frozen right now, but I bet you they're going to come out of it really, really well. But we haven't watered it at all because just the moisture, uh, the sun heats it up, it gets humid in there. So there are moisture levels, plus all the snow going into the ground, I think, benefits in oh, the moisture. Right? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, top versus bottom watering. I top water when I have seeds in there. I bottom water when I have roots. Oh. Does that make sense? Yeah. So basically, what I do is I open this up and I pour water in here instead of watering up here. And I let those plants soak it up. The more you top water, the more you leach out your nutrients. Mm -hmm. So bottom watering, I even do this with all my house plants. I bottom water everything. I have little saucers and I put the water in the saucer and the plant soaks up what it needs. And that way I'm not leaching out all of my nutrients every single time I water. All right, so suckers, for or lilac. Often, dividing suckers is a little bit harder to do because you actually have to go in, you have to dig up the sucker and make sure you get a little bit of a root zone. It is possible with for or lilac, anything like that. Very possible to go and say, hey, there's this little offset four feet away from my plant, I'm just gonna dig it up and repot it. It's all about timing. I would recommend that you did it again early spring because during the fall, things work through the root growth. If you like I've often been told that you like transplant stuff and prune stuff and do things like this in the fall. Well, sometimes it's better to do things like that in the spring. Mm -hmm. it's like when I was in school, they said prune your roses in the fall. Well, through the 10 years of my company, I've come to find I prune my roses in the spring. And I do this because if I go and I prune somebody's roses in the fall, you gotta cut them back again. I cut them back. Well, I don't know what kind of winter we're gonna have. Yeah, nice. I don't know how far down to cut those. I don't know if we're going to have so many freezes that that rose is going to get down to its little nibbins. And often the next year when I come back, I have more dead back. Yeah. So I recommend hydrangeas. Um, there's a lot of different little plants that I say cut in the spring. When you can see their buds, you can see where it's died back to and know how you're going to be able to cut that plant to make it prosperous in the new year. Um, tubers, hellebores, or begonias, offset, strawberry, yucca, where they're just the other, I mean, they're kind of like the hens and chicks and the rosettes, a little bit different. And then you also have the bulbs and corms where you can dig up your bulb patch and find all the little offsets or the baby bulbs, baby corms, and go and plant those somewhere else. Yeah, I didn't know or leave those there and take the big ones and put them somewhere else. That would be... Can you cut a yucca in half? Mm -hmm. Well, no, you can't cut a yucca in half. They have little babies that pop up off the side. That's what you can cut off. Okay. 